Well, good morning. I'm uh, Jack Davis, a crops business management field specialist out of the Mitchell office. And we'll, we'll get started here shortly with our crop hour for today. We have Dr. Tong Wang from SDSU campus in the Nest School of Management and Economics talking on carbon credits, I believe. We, uh, a couple of things, uh, we'll have a poll after we're done and then also the CCA credits will be uh, available after we after we finish. So if you got questions, you can type them in the Q and A. And as the video said, if you got problems or issues, uh, you know, raise your hand and we'll we'll try and get things taken care of. So I think we'll just go ahead and turn it over to you, Tong, and we'll go. Okay, uh, let me try to share my screen first. Okay, can you see it moving uh, downward here? Yes. Okay, all right. So uh, my topic today would be the earn carbon credit through the regenerative farming. Um, so I want to give you an overview of the topics I'm going to cover today first. So I'm going to cover first the carbon markets, uh, which includes different types of carbon market and the demand side, supply side, and on the supply side, I will introduce the different conservation practices that generate uh, the soil carbon sequestration. And then uh, I will provide some examples of the companies or programs in the carbon markets and uh, give a uh, just a, a demonstration of the different stages involved in the carbon contract process and then uh, different elements of a, a carbon contract, which is uh, from uh, a summary of uh, different companies and programs. So those elements include the price. I compare the farmer's desirable prices with the current contract offered prices. And there are different uh, eligible price practices and uh, the requirement about the historically implemented practices and uh, something about minimum enrollment acres and the requirement about mu multiple program enrollment and the land ownership requirement, contract length. And in the end, I'm going to cover some challenges faced by farmers in carbon contract enrollment. So that's uh, those are the topics to be covered today. So. I will uh, first pro provide some pro uh, background about this topic. So the background is there is an increased level of greenhouse gas emission in the atmosphere, which cause more heat being trapped and the heat loss being slowed down from the earth to space. So um, the researchers find the different um, challenges posed by the high GHG levels in the atmosphere, which include temperature rise, more drought, flooding events, and a loss of biodiversity. Those are um, just a, a few among the list. So um, these years as concerns towards GHG emission, um, those challenges continue to increase so there are more than 100 countries, including United States, have pledged to achieve non-zero, uh, net zero carbon uh, emissions by two, uh, 2050 or 60. And to achieve such goals, an increasing number of companies, they are pledging to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions as well. However, many cannot cut down their emissions at a preferable rates. So uh, there are different um, in, uh, markets like inset and uh, offset. So inset means they have to control their own emission and offset that means that they are uh, looking out for other help. So because they cannot cut down their own emission at preferable rates, they have to look uh, out for other help. So in that way, the carbon markets provide opportunities for farmers to receive carbon payments uh, so the farmers, basically, uh, if farmers can sequester carbon in the soil, and then um, the company can purchase 
those carbon credits from the farmers. So that's how the background works. And there are two types of carbon markets. So the first type is the mandatory one, which is uh, called compliance carbon markets. So which um, this in this market, a limited number of allowances is issued per company per year, referred to as a cap. So those are the regulatory requirements. So each company have a cap so that they cannot exceed that cap. And then over the years, the cap will slowly decrease, which means the company, uh, you know, the limit kind of decrease over the years. So in that way, each, comp uh, each carbon emission uh, companies will reduce their carbon emission over time. So that is how the mandatory carbon market is supposed to work. So the cap keep on reducing and uh, uh, the target emission keep on reducing for uh, each carbon emission companies. A different um, regulation system is a voluntary uh, carbon markets. So the voluntary carbon markets, it gives uh, the carbon sequestration co companies. So those are companies who remove or reduce the carbon emissions um, from the atmosphere. So those companies can earn additional revenue and they also provide carbon emitting companies with opportunities to offset their carbon emissions. So the carbon emitting companies have two options. One is uh, reduce their own emission through the inset and then purchase other people's uh, uh, sequestered carbon through the offset market. So to date, they are, um, for farmers, the voluntary carbon markets are the only markets that farmers can utilize and profit from the soil carbon sequestration and from those uh, conservation practices. Okay, with this being said, so look at, we look at the, uh, for the carbon markets, what's the demand side? Uh, first of all, uh, we know that in the carbon market, the commodity, what is the commodity is the right to emit carbon. So this commodity is different from uh, general uh, commodity market. So the like uh, corn, soybean, those are commodity, but this market, the commodity is the right to emit carbon. And the buyers are the entities who generate carbon emissions. So here is a uh, overlook of the US GHG emissions by sector in 2020. So we can see that um, in this pie, uh, the transportation sector is the highest among all the other sectors. So which account for 27% of the carbon emissions. And the second largest is the electricity sector, which is a quarter of the pie. And then the different industries accounts for about a quarter as well. And then the commercial and residential accounts for 13% of GHG emissions. And the list of all here is the agriculture, which account for 11% of GHG emissions. So we might wonder, so how agriculture um, actually contributes to the GHG emissions? So here I have a list of the agricultural practices that produce GHG emissions. So first the source, we have three sources of GHG here, the carbon dioxide, the methane, and the nitrous oxide. So we have the uh, carbon dioxide here. Uh, we have the car uh, farm equipment, um, different farm equipment, which for the purpose of tailing, planting, applying pesticides, fertilizers, harvesting, all those equipments contribute to the carbon dioxide side. And the main thing is basically the ruminant animals, which include cattle, bison, sheep, and goats. And on the um, nitro oxide here, uh, we have the fertilizer, which is the largest source of emission. And then we have the livestock manure from the confinement operations, which also a big source for this um, GHG emission. So those are three major sources uh, of the GHG emission and how the ag agricultural practices contribute to it. Okay, so with this, we look at the supply side. So the supply side are the sellers who are the entities that remove carbon emission from the air. 
So the agricultural soil is viewed as a frontier for carbon removal. So we can see that uh, mostly uh, the conventional agricultural practices, they contribute largely to the release of soil carbon into the atmosphere. However, those losses, scientists believe those losses could be re-sequestered re after a long-term adoption of different conservation practices. So here I have a list of the conservation practices that are um, research find those are the practice that sequester carbon. So those are not um, all the list, just for some uh, list that there is, um, you know, relatively more evidence about their carbon sequestration impact. So you can see uh, we listed four practices uh, and for each of the practice, there is a range of the carbon sequestration impact, which means um, this, if you adopt those practices, the carbon sequestration could vary in different regions, different weather conditions, climate conditions, uh, different farms uh, based on the soil conditions. So those could vary a lot. So we can see uh, that um, for the uh, cover crops is uh, from uh, 0.19 to 0.49 is compared to uh, the diversified crop rotation, diversified crop rotation is even higher than the cover crops. And the no-till, uh, while the lowest range is lower, but no-till have a highest potential here. And reduced till um, has a much lower carbon sequestration potential than the no-till. So those are um, just are some research results showing that the potential uh, conservation practices that can sequester carbon. So if we look at the carbon markets, the demand versus supply side. So the demand for the carbon credits is expected to grow dramatically in the coming decades. It's actually already growing in the recent years. Therefore, in order to meet the demand, it calls also for increased supply of carbon credits from the soil side, uh, the, the supply side. So therefore, that's why there is a growing interest in paying farmers for those uh, conservation practices as a means for sequestering carbon. And we can see in recent years, there is a growing number of carbon programs which provide farmers opportunity to receive carbon payments. So um, these are the some examples of the companies in the uh, voluntary market. So basically this is a, I just saw, uh, got this from uh, this United Soybean website. So they list those, um, this, if you click on their website, each of those are clickable and you can find some detailed information about each of the program, how it works, how the requirement of each program. So I just summarize them here and I want to find out how each program compare to the other and find out the differences, the similarities of different programs so that we can see, uh, have some idea of those programs. So, uh, but we can see that there are um, kind of a more and more programs emerging in this market. Okay, so those are the companies. And also I want to give you some idea of um, some necessary steps involved in carbon contract. Of course, different companies, they offer, um, you know, different um, conditions, different requirements. So the steps will vary, uh, you know, from company to company, but those are uh, generally, it works. So in that way. So first of all, uh, the farmer get enrolled and then um, adopt a new practice. Of course, this could reverse in order because some companies actually accept the practice that being changed before the enrollment of the contract. So this is generally what happens, but not necessarily in that order. And then uh, the soil is being sampled and credit quantified and verified, and then carbon credit sold and the farmer get paid. So those are some main uh, milestones in the contract but there are some details uh, I didn't provide here, uh, which I will give more details later for uh, different companies. So those are the essential steps. And among the different uh, 
carbon contract. So one of the elements is the carbon price, which is very important elements of the contract. And the different programs offer pro, uh, carbon program prices based on different measuring criteria. So he, some of them are measuring by the amount of carbon sequestered, which is dollar per ton or per metric ton. So I give a summary of the companies who provide these um, prices based on this criteria. So you can see that they each actually pro provide a price. Uh, some of them, the price is a minimum price uh, because it varies from farm to farm. So they just give a minimum price. And some of them give a range here, like 20 to 30. And uh, some of them just offer one price. So we can see that roughly that price is about, the lowest would be $15 per ton. And the highest so far uh, we can see from here is $30. So from 15 to $30 per ton, that's roughly the range uh, from the companies listed here. And another uh, criteria that the, this program, how it works is it actually measure the carbon price based on the um, per acre basis. So, uh, which means that they provide a, uh, you know, like it's not a matter by town, but they just are, you know, if you adopt this practice by how many acres and they pay you by acre. So here we can see that on the acre wise basis, we have from $10 from $31, kind of a, a variation from 10 to 30. So those are the different um, payment criteria. So, and the, the values are different. So I will later on, I will convert this, uh, you know, using the scientific result and this by per town, I will convert this to acre and to see how much uh, dollars per acre we can get from there. Okay, so before that, I want to provide you with a, just a look of what's the farmer's perception of carbon values. So these are from our 2021 South Dakota farmer survey. So we, we sent out about 700 survey questionnaires and we received 350 back. So, and we ask farmers, how do you think the carbon, uh, soil carbon value, you know, worth to you? Um, so we give them a range of from zero, dollars to one to ten dollars and all the way up to more than fifty dollars. So these among those 350 farmers who answer this question and we can see that their answers actually is scattered evenly uh, across a range of different scenarios. So in that way we can see that farmers opinions towards this carbon credit value actually varies a lot. So some farmers of uh, 17 percent believe it's worth nothing, nothing to them. And 15% think that worth more than $50. Uh, that is not maybe um, how they would like to accept, but some of them just sort of think that they, just they, those have zero value. But if you ask them how much um, carbon credit value should be provided to you in order for you to change your practice, then in that way, they would like a much higher value in that way. So we can see that um, if we offer only $10 per ton, then only 8% of farmers are waiting to change their practices. And then uh, if we offer more, $20, uh, this becomes 12%. And then $30 inc increase by uh, to 26, 27%. And all the way to $50, where we found 50% of farmers, they are waiting to change their practices at this value. In, um, so that is basically, we, we think $50 per ton is a value that farmers think that is acceptable to them. So we compare, um, okay, so I will compare the price later, but before that, I would like to show you, this is another survey, before, uh, you know, also in 2021, 
but it's not kind of a South Dakota farmer survey, but I think it's kind of a similar uh, nationwide. So I want to show you this uh, interesting survey result. So in 2031, um, so a survey from Purdue actually asked farmers about whether you are aware of carbon payment opportunities or not. So most of farmers, they are not aware of those carbon payment opportunities as of 2001. As you can see, 60% of them are not aware of those opportunities and less than 40% are aware of those opportunities. And then among those people who are aware, so they further ask a question, if you are aware, have you engaged in a discussion on receiving carbon payments? So we can see that among those four, less than 40% who are aware, only 7.1 uh, who actually engage in a discussion on whether they can receive carbon payments. So this have reduced, uh, you know, like dramatically from this 40%. And then among those people who are currently engaged in the discussion, so they are further asked about whether you have signed a carbon contract or not. So we can see that among those 7.1 people, percent of people who actually engage in this conversation, um, only 1.3 have answered yes, I have signed a carbon contract, but most of people have not signed a carbon contract. So uh, that shows that as of 2021, um, most of farmers have not actually um, enrolled in any, uh, you know, 99% of farmers have not enrolled in any carbon contract yet. So this um, is another uh, question asked them from the same survey uh, from Purdue University. They ask them about the reasons why, uh, you know, like what's the reasons that prevent you from enrolling those current programs? So the first, and you know, most farmer uh, answer this reason, reason is about the payment, the payment level offered. So 64% six, agree that the payment level offered actually prevent them from enrolling in this carbon program. Um, so as we just uh, seen just now, like we have, a farmer's acceptable level is $50, but the company offer level is only about $20 to $30. So there is a gap between the farmer acceptable levels and the company offer levels. So that's why um, most of farmers have not engaged in the carbon contract yet. And another um, is the legal liability of contract non-compliance. So this one means um, sometimes uh, the farmers, if they um, sign a contract, for example, no tail contract, so which the contract actually uh, under this contract, you have to use no tail all the years. But sometimes if the farmers want to occasionally use a tillage practice that kind of violates the contract, then you cannot get paid. So this kind of a legal liability, uh, non-compliance is also another concern um, from 38% of farmers. And another one is the farmers, uh, most of them, they are kind of critical about the carbon sequestration um, potential of the soil and how it varies from year to year. So they are not quite believing in the story. They, um, that's kind of uh, prevents them from um, just enroll that program as well. And another one is the previous use of eligible practices. As most of the programs, they don't accept those previously used of practices, they ask for some new practices or at least some new acres. So that's kind of a prevents the farmers as well. So we can say uh, most of all is the payment level offered. So here I compare, so using this current carbon payment, so I use a 25, so it's about, about average to the uh, higher end. So which is $25 per metric ton, um, this is the carbon price. And then come, uh, so this one versus the farmer acceptable price, which is $50. So we can calculate uh, based on the previous research result. Uh, previously, I just showed you the range of the carbon sequestration potential of different practices. Here, I convert those um, range of carbon potential uh, sequestration potential to the dollar value per acre per year. So under the cur current contract, we can see that the farmers can uh, receive under the current contract 
about um, maximum, if you use no-till, you can get uh, $18 per acre per year. And uh, for the acceptable level, it becomes $36 per acre per year. So um, we can see that this, um, under this current uh, you know, uh, contract offered price level, uh, the farmers just are on average maybe got $10 uh, per year, but um, under this acceptable price level, they can on average get uh, at least $20 per year uh, on average for different practices. So uh, we can see how it compared to each other, why um, the current level price is not acceptable. And here I uh, want to give you a list of eligible practices, which I summarize from different companies. So uh, most companies, I, I think so far, I didn't see any companies didn't accept the cover crops. So cover crop is one. Conservation tillage, which include no-till, reduced till, diversified crop rotation, or increased biodiversity. So those first three are uh, offered by most companies. And this nutrient management is not offered by all companies. Some companies offer a nutrient management opportunity as well, which means the nitrogen optimization, reducing nitrogen use, or improving nitrogen timing. And then some companies also op uh, offer an option of conversion to perennial cover or improved grazing practices. So those are the um, practices I found that covered by um, programs. And the first three covered by most programs and the first four uh, by um, also majority. And uh, the last two, not uh, many covered those two. Okay, so um, many producers, they kind of worry about, you know, they want to get the carbon payment, but they have implemented the practices before this carbon contract. So they don't know whether those previously implemented or historically implemented practices can get paid. So we found that, unfortunately, for both programs, those historical implemented practices are not qualified for, for payment. And those companies actually specify that only new and expanded um, expanded acres of those regenerative agriculture practices are eligible. However, I do find for some programs, there are um, programs that specified that they accept previously adopted practices. So I just give the uh, company name in a bracket here. Here, uh, the gradable mentioned that practice are adopted for two years or less are eligible. So that means within the recent two years of the contract signing date, they are still eligible. And Indigo here uh, mentioned the up to two growing seasons. So it's kind of a similar to the uh, two years um, prior to the program date. And then this tutorial offers uh, for the carbon removal within the past three years, so this kind of uh, more years. And then Nori mentioned that the farmers can be rewarded for um, the practices adopted within the last 10 years. So this is the longest time uh, we found uh, that, uh, you know, be because most of our two or three years. Um, and this one, the Lu Lucas uh, Agri Science Solutions mentioned that they didn't mention how many years, but they just mentioned that in the past, those practice adopted could be eligible if the field are treated with their uh, own um, soil he health uh, probiotics product. So this is kind of uh, related to their product, but most of them just uh, um, exclude historically implemented practice. But there is uh, four companies we found that offers, um, you know, like payment for those historically adopted practice as long as you adopt it within a certain years prior to the program. So those are the historically implemented practices and the minimum enrollment acre requirement. So we don't find um, that most of, pro most of the programs that we found that they, they didn't specify any minimum acre requirement. However, for some programs, they do have a limited acre requirements. So those ranges from 150 acres from Indigo 
to all the way to 1,000 acres for Nori. So we can see that uh, you know some company do have a uh, limit, actually a minimum acre requirement uh, for the farmers who want to enroll in their contract. So you have to enroll a minimum of this much acres in order to be part of the contract. And another concern is the multiple enrollment, which means if I enroll in one carbon credit program, can I enroll in other programs as well? So we can see uh, all the programs I checked, they actually mentioned that you cannot enroll in any other carbon credits programs. So that means the carbon credit programs, you cannot enroll uh, simultaneously in two of them. Um, so all, you know, either current enrollment or previous enrollment, which actually exclude you from the right to in, uh, enroll in a new carbon pro program. However, while this uh, carbon credit program is not allowable, but I think many programs actually allow for multiple enrollment in government programs. So, and uh, we can see that, uh, you know, like I didn't list the companies who are allowed for enrollment in government programs. Uh, I just uh, list several companies that they said, you know, certain government programs those acres are not allowed. I list those, you know, just so you can see that, you know, like only about three or four is not allowed government programs. So that means the rest of them all allowed for the government programs. So which means, um, you know, the majority actually allow for government program enrollment at the same time when you are enrolling the current credit program. So which means the farmers have opportunity to receive multiple payments uh, from different sources. Uh, only this Nori specified that they don't allow for uh, CRP land um, since 2000. And uh, Indigo mentioned that they require the land to be not enrolled in CRP and WRP. And then um, this soil and water outcomes found, this program uh, is more restrictive. They don't allow any government cost share. And uh, this agro uh, mentioned that um, have not enrolled in any other programs. So basically no other program is allowable. So those are more restrictive programs, but most of the programs they are allowing for government, government payment as well. So these are about multiple enrollment. And for the land ownership requirements, uh, we found that the lease land can be enrolled in current programs as well. Um, just uh, um, I found most programs do require permissions from land owner um, for the lease land. And um, some uh, program that they mentioned that they require the landowner permission for the soil carbon, but they don't require that for uh, the nitrogen management, which means optimal nitrogen timing, reduced nitrogen use, those they don't need uh, the landowner permission. Um, also, some programs mentioned that, that the, uh, the participants of the that who lease the land, they can enroll in the current program, but they have to lease the land throughout the full program cycle. In this, in their program, the cycle is four years, which means that you have to lease the land for four years instead of quit it in, in, in the middle. And besides those requirements I mentioned above, so there are different re other requirements here. I just uh, summarize, it varies a lot across programs. So I summarize them into different categories. So one of them requirement is the historical management data. So some program they require for historical da data like this, uh, you know, three or five years or six to 10 years. So they like farmer to provide them with some uh, historical management records. Uh, in order to be enrolled in this practice in different, uh, I mean, in the common uh, contract. And another uh, requirement is the land use. So uh, some companies require that the farmers have, have been in the crop production, either the farmers or the land have been crop production for three plus years. And there has been no land change during the past 10 years and the ecosystem have not been cleared in the past 10 years. So those are the, some requirements about the land use and farmer experience. And some other uh, requirement is about the uh, HEL land, high, 
highly erodible land and wetland, those uh, conservation compliance have to be met. And then uh, some consumer requirement and support, which means that some companies require you to be their a green consumer and have their account number. And some company, company requires uh, you have to receive basic uh, agronomic support to qualify. So uh, those are the uh, other requirements, but they are um, basically um, can be uh, categorized in those uh, categories. And the contract length is also very important. So here I summarize a table of the contract length across different companies. So you can see that the contract length actually varies a lot from all the way from one year to 10 years. So these are uh, two companies offered it from one year and the most of them I think um, actually required for a uh, contract length of five years and also um, almost a half required for 10 years. So we can see that five years and 10 years are the majority. And one year is just the two companies uh, offered a one year contract. And for those five years or four year contract, they give you an option to extend to um, for multiple circles, like uh, he, here uh, the four years can be extended to 10 years, the five years can be uh, renewed for three different additional contracts for, uh, you know, like uh, for different uh, four contracts up to 20 years. So um, here, I think uh, that's the 20 years is the highest I can see, uh, but they, there are no uh, contract that beyond that uh, 20 years. And some um, programs ask for a guaranteed commitment of at least three years. So although the, uh, the contract is 10 years, I guess that first three years you have to, uh, you know, commit it to that practice. Otherwise, you won't be paid. And after that, is paid on a year by year basis. And then um, this uh, farmers edge offer different um, years uh, length. So this one is ten years for the soil health, so, soil carbon, but for the nitrogen management, they offer for five years. So we can say overall is um, you know above five years. And uh, some of them actually require you to retain the practice after the program. For example, the gradable, the contract is five years, but you have to use the practice for additional five years so that the, the carbon can be retained, not released in the atmosphere. So uh, those are the uh, different contract length requirements. And the challenges. So, um, about the challenges, um, I found there are different size of the uh, carbon uh, market challenges. So one is a scientific evidence. So uh, we know that scientific evidence shows that soil organic carbon uh, will increase uh, over a long time after you adopt a practice, a conservation practice. However, the year to year change in soil organic carbon, this measurement is highly uncertain and haven't been established yet. So in that way, uh, because most companies mentioned that they will pay on a yearly basis per acre per year. So because of this challenge, so carbon measurement and verification on this year to year basis could be very difficult and expensive. So this is the um, challenge from the scientific evidence side and from the um, you know, demand side when the, the contract uh, program is hard to measure and how it's hard to for them to verify. Also, the challenges coming from the farmer side as well, because the adoption of new uh, practices coming with the high investment cost in the new invest new equipment and the infrastructure. So those are uh, the cost might not be covered by the current payment. So that's why uh, most of farmers, they ask for more payment, $50 per ton of carbon sequestered, but the current payment is a, kind of a, only halfway through that, that level. So that's kind of a high investment cost is from the farmer side. Um, another way is both from the farmer side, also from the program side. So that's kind of opposed the, what about the, um, effectiveness of the carbon market program, you know, like, so this kind of the risk coming from, so because each carbon contract have a limit of years, 
if you enroll in a um, contract of five years, how about after five years? What if the farmers after five years kind of discontinue their previous adopted practices? And then that will release the carbon already sequestering of soil into, into the atmosphere. So it's some, sometimes it's common, for, for example, the farmers could use conventional tillage in some years after use no-till. So they get paid for the no-till, but afterwards, uh, this could be discontinued. So this challenge actually posed some questions about the effectiveness of the carbon program. So those are the uh, three challenges from different sides, from the scientific evidence side, from the farmer side, from the program effectiveness side. Those are pro probably the uh, potential challenges we found that with the current carbon market. So that's all I want to uh, introduce about the carbon market, how do you want to uh, engage in it and get payments, and what's the um, challenges and how you want to choose a, a different program or companies based on different criteria. So that's uh, kind of a, a summary of uh, this presentation. Thank you. So do we have any questions?